Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. My name is Dr. Bernard Lee, and I'm indeed honored and privileged to be given the opportunity to speak at this meeting. Today's session will be a debate on the biceps in the athlete, and I'm going to share my thoughts on the biceps tenotomy. I think firstly, we have to remind ourselves what the clinically relevant anatomy is, because these are the factors that will eventually affect the outcomes. It has been suggested that the biceps actually be divided into three separate zones. So the biceps labral complex is divided into the inside zone, which is made up of the superior labrum as well as the biceps anchor. The junctional zone, which is actually the intraarticular long head of biceps tendon, as well as the biceps pulley, as well as the bicipital tunnel, which is really the extraarticular long head of biceps tendon. Now, if you look at the bicipital tunnel itself, this has also been suggested to be divided into three further zones, which is zone one and two and three. Zone one is basically the bony bicipital groove, which you're all very familiar with. Zone two starts from the distal margin of the subscapularis tendon and extends to the proximal margin of the pec major tendon. And this is termed no man's land. And the reason for that is because this is the region where we can't visualize the biceps tendon either intra-articularly uh, or subpectorally. Zone three really is the subpectoral region of the bicipital tendon. Now, if you look at the zonal anatomy, uh, the important points to note here are that the osseous floor changes from the deep osseous floor to a shallow and then eventually flat osseous floor as you go from zone one to two to three. And the other interesting thing here is to note that the, there is synovium that is present even in a fair number of specimens in this cadaveric study down to zone two and even into zone three. And the implication of this is that pathology involving the synovium can actually extend all the way down into zone three. Um, the other thing about the bicipital tunnel is that it has also been shown in cement mold casting that the entire tunnel is enclosed, is completely enclosed. So whatever pathology uh, happens in the tunnel tends to stay in the tunnel. There's also a possible bottleneck uh, between zone two and three where the, where the pec major tendon arches over the humerus. And uh, that can result in a lot of uh, bottleneck problems as the tendon moves from zone two to zone three. So I think it, the main clinically relevant thing that we need to remember is that there is still synovium present in the bicipital tunnel and that extends all the way down to zone three. The other thing is also that the long term bicep tendon is completely enclosed in the bicipital tunnel. Now, as far as pathology is concerned, what are we treating? So once we know what we're treating, that will sort of affect our decision making in the treatment plans that we have in the surgical plans that we have. So on the inside zone, the main things are really the slab lesions, the square labral lesions, as well as uh, the incarceration of the long head, the biceps tendon, which has been described. This is pretty much doing an O'Brien's test where you internally rotate and add up the shoulder. And uh, what happens then is the long head, the biceps tendon gets incarcerated between the glenoid and the humeral head. Yeah, in the junctional regions, you can get tears of the tendon. You can get synovitis. Um, in the video here, what you're seeing is actually a, a, a tear in the long head biceps tendon as it turns around the bicepital pulley to go into the groove. The other lesions that have been described uh, include pulley lesions and junctional chondromalacia. Here, Pascal Boileau has also described the hourglass biceps lesion, which is basically a flattening of the long head biceps tendon just before it enters the pulley. And the result of which is when the shoulder moves of, uh, in elevation and abduction, the tendon cannot glide into the groove because it's blocked uh, due to the increase in diameter of the tendon. And that causes this accordion-like effect in the shoulder, which can affect how much the shoulder can move passively. Going down the bicipital tunnel, there are multiple things that can happen. Tendon tears are common. Synovitis is very common. The other thing that we don't often realize is present is actually adhesions and scar tissue in the bicipital groove. Loose bodies have been noted, osteophytes and osteostenosis can also cause problems within the bicepital groove. And there's also this problem of instability where the long head of bicep tendon can dislocate. So knowing that there are other pathologies that are present, not just in the intraarticular portion of the long head of bicep tendon, um, it has been found that there's, there is persistent post-operative pain in a significant number of patients who have undergone isolated biceps tenotomy or tenodesis. And it's been found in tenotomy patients to be present in 19% of the cases, as well as in tenodesis patients to be present in 24% of the cases. 
I think the important thing is to realize that there's a lot of mispathology and this can result in persistent biceps pain. Yeah, the, a separate study also showed that uh, if you did a biceps procedure and you release the biceps sheath over the, the bony bicepedal groove, the revision rates uh, for these procedures were reduced to 6.8% uh, for biceps tenotomy and 20.6% for biceps tenodesis. So how do we actually visualize the biceps tendon? Well, most of us know this. We do an arthroscopic pull test. We put a probe into the shoulder. We pull the biceps tendon down to try to pull as much of the tendon out of the groove as possible. But really, this only visualizes about 32% of the entire tendon. And if you're looking at just the tendon in the bicepedal groove, and that's the picture on the right, it only visualizes 78% of the tendon that's in zone one. And uh, the excursion that we can get is only 14 to 15 millimeters. So really doing an arthroscopic pull test does not really give us a complete idea of what pathology is going on further down the groove. Concealed lesions are not uncommon. Uh, the extra-articular biceps tunnel uh, does conceal a lot of lesions. And 47% of patients uh, in Taylor uh, et al. study, they found that uh, lesions were hidden from view compared when we were doing it uh, with uh, intra-articular visualization. A separate study also showed that there were 33% of lesions were concealed because they were not visible from standard glenohumeral arthroscopy. The 45% of junctional lesions also had extra-articular lesions. So these were separate lesions. So even if you find something in the joint, you might actually find something else, uh, sort of like a skip lesion down the bicipital groove. Um, a lot of intra-articular lesions actually extend directly into the groove as well. Um, and in uh, the Korean study, what they found was that 100% of tears actually followed into the groove and 77.8% actually followed past the groove into zone two. Likewise, tenosynovitis was also found to extend distal to the groove into zone two and three in 72.2% of cases. So we just have to remember that when we bring a patient to the operating theater, we have to look out for missed lesions. Otherwise we may end up with suboptimal results regardless of whether we do a tenotomy or a tenodesis. So the question then for this debate is, can we cut a long head of biceps tendon? Do we actually lose function and strength? Um, so if you look at function, the questions we ask, does this stabilize the humeral head? It's been long been suggested that it's a humeral head depressor and that the, the biceps actually stabilizes the shoulder during motion, but um, not, not too long ago, uh, electromyographic studies actually showed that a long head of biceps tendon does not actively stabilize the shoulder. When they took the elbow out of the equation, there was hardly any electromyographic uh, uh, activity in, on active motion of the shoulder. Uh, the long head of bicep tendon does seem to decrease humeral head translation when loaded. For example, when the elbow is in flexion or when the elbow is being used. And this may provide some shoulder stability uh, as long as the elbow is being loaded and used in in uh, activities. Uh, more relevant to the question that we have asked, in the, what, what, what does uh, the long head of biceps do in pitching athletes? So uh, in a study where they actually tenodes patients, they actually found that there was no difference in glenohumeral translation between normal and tenodes patients in the late cocking phase as well as during lifting. And uh, it was also found in a separate study that muscle activation and pitching kinematics were restored after bicep tenodesis. This seemed to suggest that, that releasing the biceps tendon from the uh, superior glenoid the cubicle does not seem to cause any issues. How about weakness? Does it cause weakness? Uh, a long time ago, in 1988, it was uh, studied in patients who had spontaneous rupture along the biceps tendon, where they compared unrepaired versus repaired tendons. And they, what they found was there was 21% loss of supination strength and 8% loss of flexion strength. However, in a big study which compared biceps tenotomy versus tenodesis versus a non-surgical arm, there was actually found to be no difference in forearm supination as well as elbow flexion strength between the groups. So really, can we cut the biceps tendon? It, it does seem that the long head of biceps does not affect shoulder function when pitching and in lifting. And uh, the studies so far have suggested there have been no significant 
differences between groups in forearm supination and elbow flexion if you compare biceps tenodesis tenotomy as well as in normal controls. So what are the clinical results then after biceps tenotomy? So if you look at patients who have undergone biceps tenotomy for isolated biceps pathology, um, you can, if we see that you know, there is a 90% return to sport and uh, return to work at 96.7%. And then average time of return to sport is only 1.9 weeks. You compare that with biceps tenodesis, where we tend to, 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 to hold back the patients a lot longer for the tenodesis to fully heal. The complication rate in this uh, study also showed 13.3%, uh, but one, only one was due to cosmesis or pain. The other two uh, were due to overhead function and uh, which was uh, overhead pain, which uh, subsequently was diagnosed as impingement syndrome and one with persistent pain in the groove. And uh, all the poor results, uh, which were an ASES score of less than 70 in the study were related to these four patients with complications. So really um, for patients with isolated biceps tenotomy and for biceps pathology, there seems to be a fairly good return to sport and work rate, although there may be a cosmetic deformity. Uh, in the setting of a rotator cuff tear that's irreparable, these are older patients. Uh, generally, there's good satisfaction with good improved function as uh, in these patients uh, who did not have their rotator cuff repaired. Uh, but however, there was also a known incidence of cosmetic deformity. So if you look at the results of uh, bicep tenotomy, systematic review, the meta-analysis have been done. Uh, generally, what they found is they get good functional results with no difference in constant ASES scores. There's no uh, difference in pain VAS scores and flexion strength of the, at the elbow is also uh, pretty good. Um, are patients happy with this? Well, when they looked at the patient satisfaction after biceps tenotomy, there was generally high satisfaction rate with 91% of patients being satisfied. Uh, despite having some patients with cosmetic deformities and cramping as well as spasms, which were generally mild. So really clinical results after bicep tenotomy, there is a fairly good return to sport. There is good functional scores. There are also good outcomes. And generally the patients uh, do report high satisfaction rates despite the cosmetic deformity. So Bicep tenotomy techniques, they're easy to perform. There's obviously no hardware or no drilling complications that are uh, related with the uh, with, uh, bicep tenodesis. Um, generally, the techniques involve tenotomy at the bicep's anchor. If the intraarticular portion of the bicep tendon is diseased or damaged, then the, the idea is to also excise the intraarticular disease tendon. Several authors have also come up with autotenodesis techniques where they, where they tenotomize the bicep's tendon at the uh, superior labrum and they allow the, the biceps tendon to actually retract a little bit into the bicepal groove but not fully retract into the groove. We'll have a look at these in, a, in the upcoming slides. So tenotomy the biceps ankle, there are many ways to do it. Radio frequency is very common. Uh, the other way to do it is with arthroscopic scissors. Now, this takes some time. Uh, it has also been described uh, that you can use a percutaneous technique with a needle through the anterior portal. So you don't really need to make a portal. This is the, known as the saber technique. Frankly, my personal preferred technique is to just use a medicine bomb scissors from the anterior portals. It's a very quick and easy procedure. Usually it only takes one at the most two snips and the tendon is completely released. Uh, as far as autotenodesis techniques are concerned, there are a few which you can try if you like. Um, this study uh, is the anchor shaped technique. And what they do is they make an oblique cut along the length of the bicep tendon, and this sort of forms a little anchor, and after which they tenotomize the tendon uh, at its insertion. And what happens is when this tendon retracts into the groove, the, the split in the long head of bicep tendon prevents the tendon from migrating fully into the groove. Separately, this is the funnel tenotomy. Same thing, you do an oblique uh, incision, uh, or the, or, or oblique release of the tendon, at its insertion and because of the wider part of the tendon, this does not allow the tendon to slide fully into the uh, bicepal groove. And uh, not long ago, there was also this uh, technique called the loop bicep tenotomy, where you use a sharp uh, bird beak or uh, uh, grasper to penetrate the long-headed bicep tendon in the intraarticular region, after which a blunt grasper is used to hold the tendon while the tenotomy is completed. And the end of the tenotomized end of the tendon is then pulled through the bicep tendon to form a sort of a loop. And this 
thickened loop then prevents the bicep tendon from migrating distally into the bicep groove. In all these studies, they've basically shown that they can reduce the incidence of the Popeye lesions, if that matters. But I think we should just bear in mind that if there are lesions in the bicycle group, that we may still have problems with persistent pain. So as far as bicep tenotomy and the athlete is concerned, and here we're saying not just we're not just considering young athletes, but also the older athlete. Bottom line is that bicep tenotomy is a simple and fast procedure to perform. There are no significant, significant functional or clinical impairments. And this obviously obviates the risks associated with bicep tenodesis. In general, this procedure is acceptable by most patients. And the main downside is really cosmesis as well as some mild pain or cramping, which does tend to go away. However, um, if, if we are still considering but uh, autotenodesing techniques, I would just remind everybody just to remember that if there are lesions down in the bicepital tunnel or distal in the extra articular portion of the biceps tendon, that we may end up with a situation of persistent pain. So do pay attention to and address hidden lesions as far as possible. So that's my spiel on it, and that's cut. Thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over the, the, the time and the stage now to the next speaker.